Gupta, who's going to be discussing the role of immunosuppressive therapy in uveitis. On to you, doctor. Thank you, Chitra. Thank you, AIS, Srinivas, Chitra, the entire team. The topic given to me was immunosuppression. So I just thought, what is the usual story that I see sitting in my clinic? Most of the investigation done outside negative, maybe non-infectious uveitis, and the patients come with files which show, okay, it was diagnosed as non-infectious, a short course of corticosteroids. So the plan is 50 milligram three days, 40 milligram three days, 30 milligram three days. Like it's, it's a protocol. And then recurrent sucker, then another course of steroids. And so this story continues on and on. So what happens to the patients few years later? Patients end up in a scenarios like this, plusio pupillae, complicated, peripheral interior synechae, posterior synechae, or necrotizing form of scleritis, or if you are dealing with the posterior segment, you might end up with sunset glow. For example, this is a patient with weak age. Now, why do we end up the way we do? Because we do not manage our uveitis very seriously. So though corticosteroid is not a part of my talk, but corticosteroids are not being covered elsewhere, so I felt the moral responsibility to cover them. These are still the mainstay of therapy since 1950. And if you ask me, these are the most effective immunosuppressive agents that we have. Only thing which postgrads you need to understand is when you start with the low dose of corticosteroids, they are anti-inflammatory. They are not immunosuppressive. So don't, if you really want to treat uveitis, don't give that half-hearted 30 milligram, 40 milligram. It has to be one to 1.5 milligram per kg per day to get its immunosuppressive effect. So they started way back in 1950 and still today they remain the best drug which acts very fast and which is the kind of fire extinguisher in uveitis. The problem, the problem is pleiotropy, which means they have so many adverse effects, growth retardation, osteoporosis, wound healing, metabolic disturbances, and so on. What is the root? Previous speakers have shown you anterior, topical, intermediate, periocular, and be careful, like you already saw these pictures from Sudarshan, topical, but I think it's very important to learn how to give. If you see an inflammation like this, start half hourly, one hourly, two weeks should be two hourly, three weeks, four hourly, four weeks, four times, five weeks, three times, and within six weeks, you come to six weeks, uh, twice a dose. This is if everything is going very fine, but taper it very slowly. Suppose you have a patient of angst who is coming back to you when he is on BID dose. Continue three times a dose, even for six months, eight months. Look at the past pattern. Don't be in a hurry to taper off steroids. Systemic, you could use either oral or intravenous and majority of these conditions, which are very uh, rapidly causing vision threatening would need intravenous steroids. Now, oral steroids, I already mentioned, give it one to 1.5 daily after breakfast. High dose steroids should not be continued for more than one month, which means if the disease worsen or is not completely quiet after four weeks, you need something which replaces corticosteroids. And that is where immunosuppression set in. So as a bottom line, the rule of thumb is that if you need corticosteroids more than 10 milligram per day to suppress the inflammation, it means these are the patients who need immunosuppression. So Immunosuppression, all the drugs take four to six weeks to act. So that means it doesn't happen that you wait for steroids for four weeks. 
And after four weeks, when you want to reduce steroids, you add immunosuppression, no. You should give them together in all the conditions like VK, sympathetic, GIAs, Bechets, and so many other conditions. I'm not talking of biologics here. I'm talking of standard immunosuppressives. These are the condition we know that we will have to give immunosuppression. So start them as early as possible so that by the time you have to taper off corticosteroid, your immunosuppressives are already working. Uh, so this are all the side effects just to reiterate that you cannot give steroids on long-term basis. So immunosuppressives, I already mentioned you prescribe in consultation with internist. There was a question about this at the early. Internist should be there to hold your hand, not to guide you. So you tell internist, well, this is the patient. I want to start the immunosuppression. These are the labs I have got done. To me, everything is normal, but you kindly look at it once. Maybe not all the time, but just once. Rule out any systemic or local infection. Be very careful that whatever you are treating, it is a reversible disease process. And I has a potential for vision. Don't start treating blind eyes, which you feel have no potential. You should be able to monitor blood counts and liver function frequently, depending on whatever drug you are using. And it's very important before you start immunosuppression to discuss with the patient as well as the family, because they will be young girl, reproductive age group. And so you have to be very sensitive, discussing with them about the risk as well as the benefit of starting these drugs. For postgrads, these are few of the drugs you need to know, which we commonly use. Antimetabolites, azathioprine, methotrexate, MMF. T cell inhibitors, cyclosporine, tacrolimus, we don't use them in daily practice too commonly. Most of the times, we are always on antimetabolites. Alkylating agent, cyclophosphamide, chromosome. Cyclophosphamide used to be used in past and still is the kind of the last weapon which we have, mostly in necrotizing variety of scleritis. With the availability of biologics, its use has been very limited now. Azathioprine is some of the drug which is very well absorbed, very cheap, very affordable. The dose is one to three milligram per kg per day. You could give it a single or divided. It can be used either alone or you can use it with other immunosuppressive drugs or you can also combine it with steroid, some doses and some of the uh, diseases, which is honestly, we are not these days treating on immunosuppression, but these remain the conventional indications. You have to be uh, aware of the side effect of anything that you use. So when we look at the side effects, azathioprine has myelosuppression, which means you've got to get your hemogram at the beginning and repeat it at regular interval. I generally do it six to eight weeks. Hepatotoxy is another one, which means you will have to monitor the blood uh, liver function. So if you are starting on azathioprine, just make sure to monitor complete blood counts every four to six weeks, whereas the liver enzymes every three months. Methotrexate is another one. We heard Kalpana saying that she likes using methotrexate. It's very effective. It's a folic acid analog, which inhibits both T and B cell. Oral absorption is kind of erratic. So a subcutaneous dose is very well tolerated, but again, it's your choice. And it's very interesting that you got to give it once a week. So it's very convenient for the patient. Usually it's 7.5 to 20 milligram once a week. And make sure the patient receives folic acid, five milligrams, uh, five days a week. And the day patient receives methotrexate, the patient should not take folic acid on that particular day. 
Again, these are the usual indications, sarcoidosis, HLA B27, GIAs, multifocal coronitis, and in fact, any uveitis which requires long-term treatment. Side effect of methotrexate is more of a hepatotoxicity besides myelosuppression and interstitial pneumonia. So how would you monitor? You monitor like as a thyphrin, blood counts four to six weeks with the liver enzymes also have to be done six weeks. In practicality, liver enzymes are a bit more expensive to get it done. So if your patient is really economically not so good, probably azathioprine might be a better choice. Again, do not panic looking at the values of liver enzymes. Like instead of 60, if it is 70, don't start sending the patient to hepatologist. If it is raised more than twice the normal value, Actually, it is three times, but to be on the safer side, if it is more than twice, repeat it. If it is more than twice on two different occasions, that is the time when you should call your internist if you do not have it on regular basis. MMF, another wonderful drug, uh, which is actually very well tolerated and can be used instead of these two. Adverse effects are actually less compared to the previous two, just GI upset, liver enzymes, bone marrow, same, but they are much less. Again, you need to monitor. And a beautiful study by Dr. Ratanam shows that NMMF and methotrexate both are equally effective. Note that MMF is an expensive drug. So methotrexate works really well in country like ours. Cyclosporin is last, and I will not really like to teach my postgrads about cyclosporin because this is not the drug that we use as a routine. So staying well within the time, I would like to say that corticosteroids in the immunosuppressive dose still remain the mainstay of therapy. Frequent, adequate dose is very important. Two things which you have to remember. When giving corticosteroid, you start high and then reduce. This is in contrast to immunosuppression. Immunosuppression like azathioprine, when you want to start, you can start at a lower dose because you will not always have the facilities to look for the enzymes and TIMPs and also what you do. You just start it at a low dose, 50 milligram. Repeat the LFT and enzymes after two weeks. Everything normal, step it up to 100 milligram. Methotrexate, start at a lower and then step up if everything remains fine in two weeks. Immunosuppressions are need to be required for a long time in maintenance dose. You don't give immunosuppressive therapy for two, three months and stop, no. Immunosuppressive agents take about three to four months to settle down. And the end point general consensus is they would be needed for about two years in non-infectious uveitis. And they should be, uh, aim is to achieve the long-term remission, which means that if you have started immunosuppression, the effect will be seen as reduced recurrences over a period of maybe two or five years, but the acute episodes you may have to manage with corticosteroids. And very important, always rule out infections. Give your patient good instructions as to how to avoid because you are suppressing the immunity. So you need to counsel and talk to the patients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Aishali. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, extremely informative and really give us a deep, great insight. Srinivas, would you ask a question or shall we go on to our next question talk? I want to ask you, as we all know, rifampicin is a potent inducer of the P450 oxidative system. In how many set of cases do you really think that we might have to increase the dosage of the uh, whatever oral steroids we are using? In what, how many percentage of the patients do you think that we have to do it? It's very difficult to comment on the percentage of cases, but in general, uh, we anyways advocate the full dose of steroids, which is 1 to 1.5 milligram. So I think rifampicin does not really bother 
it affects when you are giving rifampicin with a low dose steroid. It doesn't really work. So I would just go with the usual dose of one milligram per kg and rifampicin. And if I feel it's not working, I may just increase it a little bit or supplement it with the local. So the local supplement like Ozodix and all work very well in these situations rather than because I did not have time, but 60 milligram per day, when you give it for more than one week, you are increasing the risk of avascular necrosis of him. So in such cases, always supplement with the local rather than just increasing the Point well done. Thank you. Thank you.